So welcome to day two of the 50th annual CAGS conference. We're just going to give people a couple of minutes to join the session. Um, in the meantime, certainly use the chat function to introduce yourselves to colleagues across the country. Um, you can have your video on or off, whatever your preference is. And just as a suggestion up in the right hand corner for that view, you might want to select side by side speaker view. That way you'll see each presenter as they speak. So we'll be starting in about two minutes. Hi, my name is Andrea Graham. I'm part of the CAGS conference team, and this is day two of the 58th annual CAGS conference. Just before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, again, you want to keep yourself muted during the duration. You can have your video on or off. That's your personal preference. Um, the presenters ask that you use the chat function on Zoom to add your comments, your thoughts, and then there will be a formal question and answer session after all the presenters have completed their presentation presentation. For French translation, English translation, when you came to the session's landing page, you will see there is the translation app that you can download for your preference of language. Otherwise, we're going to get started. At this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Susan Porter, who many of you uh, would have met yesterday through yesterday's excellent plenary. Dr. Porter is CAG's past president and dean and vice provost of graduate and postdoctoral studies at the University of British Columbia. Dr. Porter. Thanks so much, Andrea. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce Sandra Lapointe um, to lead this uh, panel session on foundational skills needs and what social sciences and humanities need to know. So Sandra is a professor of philosophy at McMaster University and research affiliate at the Bertrand Russell Research Center there. Uh, her scholarly work focuses on the history of philosophical study of <clears throat> logic, mind, and language in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, but she's here today primarily around her, um, I would say, very passionate direction of uh, the collaborative, which is a partnered initiative uh, with the mission to foster better collaborative culture around social science and humanities education, talent, and impact. Over to you, Sandra. Thank you so much. Susan, it's great to see you. So yes, um, the first thing I think I would like to do is to um, mention that I'm speaking today from Hamilton, which is home to McMaster University. And I would like to recognize that uh, McMaster University is located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations and within the lands that are protected by the dish with one spoon, wampum agreement. And I know that participants uh, to CAG's annual uh, conference and the speakers for today's panel are logging in from across the country and, and we extend our respect to all First Nations, Inuit and Métis people for their valuable past and present contributions to this land. And I'm of course, extremely pleased and, and thankful to introduce our fantastic panel today. Um, Wendy, I don't know if Wendy has managed to join, but I know that she will. Uh, Wendy Sukir uh, is a professor of management at the Ted Rogers um, School of Management at Ryerson University. And she's also the director of the Diversity Institute and a co-founder of the Future Skills Center. Tim Wilson is associate vice president uh, for research programs at the Social Science and Humanities Research Council. 
Etienne Rainville uh, is a senior government relations officer at Universities Canada. Gail, it, Gail Bucket is a director of uh, innovation policy at MyTax and Ian Worley, who's going to join us. Uh, we all know him. He is the uh, maître de cérémonie for this conference. He is the executive director of CAGS. So thanks everyone for being here. I'm delighted. I'm going to start by saying a little bit about the excuse or the, uh, um, the excuse for our meeting today. So I'm the director of the collaborative. And as Susan was mentioning, the collaborative is a shirk funded initiative, which over the last three years has dedicated a portion of its research efforts to uh, creating new models of experiential learning and research talent building in the social science and humanities. We do other things, but that's one of our focuses. And uh, the occasion uh, for our panel today is the publication of a report. It's actually being published today. Uh, and that report, which we're going to be discussing, is an attempt to answer some of the questions that have kept surfacing along the way over the last three years, the most important of which is what are foundational skills employers say they need and why should the social science and humanities care? So when we made uh, the decision to dedicate a research effort to turning these thoughts we had about uh, how our project could contribute into a discussion paper, we had a specific group of post-secondary stakeholders in mind, chairs, committees and deans in the social science and humanities and arts faculties who make decision about curriculum, both at the undergrad and the graduate level, members of uh, you know, senior leadership in universities whose role is to support social science and humanities programming and research, and those in the Canadian social science and humanities research and innovation ecosystem who are responsible for cultivating knowledge and talent in increasingly uh, complex and collaborative and interdisciplinary conditions. We adopted a, an end user integrated approach to research and I'm delighted, delighted to say that the panel participants have been involved before today in one way or another in, in consultations and panels whose purpose was to ensure that we are asking the right questions to inform practices and policies. So what, what is the report about? The report starts by drawing a picture of employers' claims about skills needs, focusing on their claims about soft, social, human, transferable, or global competencies that are increasingly associated with uh, social science and humanities education, à tort ou à raison, that's to be discovered. For all of us in the social science and humanities, and as uh, Susan mentioned, my home is in the philosophy department and I have a bona fide nerd track record. For all of us in the social science and humanities, this knowledge is power. At the very least, we need uh, principled reasons to respond or not to respond to the demands industry, government, and the private sector make on our institutions. And in order to take the skills narrative into our own hands, we need to understand in our own terms what these demands are. And assuming that this falls within our academic mission, and I do think that it does, what we can do about that. So we wanted to develop an analytical framework that could be expanded and used as a metacognitive toolkit to help articulate the value of social science and humanities know-how. And this seemed to be especially useful in a context where workforce disruptions are increasingly frequent. It would allow social science and humanities graduates and from you know, the first, uh, from the undergraduate as well as the postgraduate levels to think with an appropriate level of literacy about the ways the skills they acquire through their education in the social science and humanities can be articulated and applied in various contexts. And then we set out to assess the disconnect between employers' perceptions of their own skills need and social science and humanities perceptions of their capacity to meet these needs. Predictably, 
social science and humanities generally consider that it falls within their purview to help build skills employers identify as central to innovation and adaptability. So skills such as critical thinking, effective problem, problem solving, creativity, and analytical skills. However, the skills associated with social, emotional, and ethical intelligence, skills like judgment, integrity, teamwork, self-management, and intercultural awareness are almost completely and universally overlooked, as if social science and humanities were not a fruitful ground to cultivate them. And this, to me and to the research team, was quite puzzling. What explains the oversight? Well, in my opinion, what explains the oversight is not an incapacity in principle on the part of social science and humanities, but gaps in our knowledge. In uh, one word, we need more research. However, knowledge gaps are not the only factor. Social science and humanities researchers are understandably wary of being perceived to be the means of corporate gain. I know I am. And social science and humanities culture is and I think rightly so skeptical. Some of us might even believe that research and teaching that uh, reflects a commitment to fair and uh, social and economic institutions and inclusive citizenships are incompatible with serving the needs of industry. But that's when I think people go too far. And I think that this is where there is a mistake. And here's why I believe that. When they don't pursue academic careers, social science and humanities, and very, very few of them actually do manage to pursue academic careers, social science and humanities graduates overwhelmingly populate the public and not-for-profit sectors, and they must have foundational skills to ensure that the organizations and institutions in which they partake fulfill their purpose and thrive. As is the case in industry settings, employees in the academic, public, and not-for-profit sector need the skills to innovate and adapt. And they need the skills to work with others in ways that show social, emotional, and ethical intelligence. The collaborative, the, the so-called collaborative skills, so those skills that we associate with teamwork, effective communication, self-management, and intercultural awareness are especially important. Employers need employees who have those skills, but, and this is where my heart is, the social science and humanities research ecosystem does as well. Collaborative skills do feature is about among those aspects of talent that the, search, the social science and humanities research council considers to be es essential to excellence in research. And, you know, partnered and interdisciplinary and collaborative projects are increasingly encouraged and rewarded. So I think that the misalignment between social science and humanities understanding of what employers need and what employers in fact say they need raises a number of questions, many of which in fact point to missed opportunities for social science and humanities to take control of the narrative around talent and to reaffirm the academic mission without frustra frustrating what I think are really unexpected allies. And when I think about what we've discovered with our research, I see potential for social science and humanities discipline to grow and regain much of the terrain that they've lost over the course of the last decades, because we have. And as I see it, the misalignment be between the perceived needs of industry and Canadian universities say promotional strategies does not reflect a deficit on the part of the social science and humanities, but rather represents an opportunity to articulate their value. So I hope that I've made you all very, very um, excited about this report. What I'm going to do is I'm going to um, put the link to the report in the chat box if you want to take a look at it. But I'm first and foremost going to invite our panelists to uh, comment and to bring ideas that are connected to the topic that we've explored in the hope that we can broaden the discussion and also eventually work towards some sort of consensus around the big issues. So our first, our next speaker is 
And I don't know if Wendy has managed to come. So these are just the main takeaways. But yep, Wendy, here. great, fantastic. Hi, Wendy. I'm so glad you, you made it. Good to see you. You have the floor. You too. Thanks very much. So full disclosure, I'm uh, from a business school, so only vaguely <coughs> legitimized as part of the social sciences uh, community. But I did do a master's degree in medieval history before I uh, started working and then eventually went to the dark side. And I guess um, my view is a, a little different perhaps than others. I think that in the current environment, um, many students and their families um, who often are, are helping them go to university actually expect them to come out with jobs. And as Sandra mentioned, increasingly there are fewer jobs <coughs> in mainstream acad academia. I think one of the big issues when we're looking at um, uh, bridging the gaps between what employers say they want and, and what graduates have comes down to um, terminology and making sure we're clear about what we mean. Um, and Sandra, if you go to the next slide, I think I have an example. We did a survey, for example, and asked graduates and students um, if they thought they were proficient in writing, if they thought they had uh, good communication skills, not surprisingly, over 90% thought they did. And probably in many cases, their faculty um, supervising them thought so as well. But when you looked at employer responses, uh, the employers uh, didn't really agree that, that uh, far fewer thought that they were proficient in writing or in oral communication. And some of that has to do with the understanding of what oral communication is, what writing is. A student may think they writing a 40 page paper with footnotes um, is, is evidence of, of good writing ability. And an employer may think that being able to craft a one page memo is, is the standard. So we need more um, definition about the skills, but then also the application of those skills and the, the genre and so on we're looking at. And, and certainly, and I know Sandra and I've had many debates about this, there, there is evidence from standardized tests that many university graduates do not um, have the level of skills that perhaps universities think are being um, offered, whether we're talking about basic literacy or numeracy. If you go to the next slide, Sandra. And, and I think that the, these definitional issues also apply when we talk about things like digital skills. Uh, one of the things that I fight a lot around um, is this notion that uh, digital skills means STEM. Um, the focus on engineering and computer science as the solution to all that ails us for example, I think is really misdirected. And when we think about um, innovation and transformation, even from a very corporate perspective, it's very clear that you need people who make technology, but even more, you need people who understand how it should be applied. And this is just one example, again, of this miscommunication mis, uh, or deliberate or, or um, unintentional where the OECD came out and said the number one skill that employers in the province of Ontario want are digital skills. And all, some of you may be old enough to remember when we had this uh, discussion 20 years ago now and the response of the province was to double the number of computer scientists and engineers to bridge the skills gap. But if you unpack what employers actually said that they needed, what you would see that among those digital skills, only about 10% were what we would call deep technical skills, Java developers and so on. 75% of what employers were talking about was use of Microsoft Office and Excel, Excel spreadsheets. I can teach you that in a couple of days. And so I do think that um, if you accept that we should be creating pathways for graduates into employment outside of academia, we have to really grapple at some of these with some of these issues and figure out what the what the potential pathways are for developing these skills. I would not, for a moment, suggest 
that the philosophy department should be running courses in Excel. But what I would say is that I can take a philosophy graduate, put them through a boot camp, and increase their chances of employment dramatically. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Wendy. I love it when you come and give you give us your take on on what we need because it is very very synergetic with what I think is think is the value of a social science and humanities degree, and it does not affect the way in which we conceive of curriculum. So thank you. I hope there will be questions about that in discussion. So our next speaker is. Tim Wilson from Shirk. Uh, thank you very much, Sandra. It's my pleasure to uh, to be here. Um, so, so my perspective coming from Shirk is um, on this question around SSH skills um, has to do with uh, with with research talent. So, our our role in, in trying to build the research talent ecosystem and and research skills and, and for us that primarily means investments in graduate students so so we uh we have a couple of ways of supporting graduate students uh directly through through uh fellowships and scholarships and and indirectly through our, our research grants that go primarily to professors and they will uh they fund about 65 percent of all the grant money goes to students in in, in some form um now so the problem it seems to me is a supply and demand problem we have here that was underlined by the recent recent uh, CCA report where we were producing uh, uh, and, and that, that provided the numbers on PhDs, but it's similar for, for, other, for other cohorts as well, but we're producing an increasing number of, of these PhDs and they're, they're finding uh, fewer and fewer homes, uh, both in academia and else, elsewhere. So, so, uh, so I think there's good work uh, that you've under, undertaken, Sandra, and you're underlining it yourself as well, Wendy, in terms of trying to understand the demand side. So what, is, what do employers want and, and what's going on? Not enough people, I think, or not, not, not enough schools are, are doing that look at the demand side, I think. So I think it's, it's great that you, you've done some of that work. Then on the supply side, I think, you know, we've, we've, we've got a number of things to look at. I think there's the skills awareness gap uh, you know, do do people, as as you're pointing out, uh, both of you have already pointed out, there are skills there, but maybe they're not articulated as such. Maybe they don't see them as, maybe they don't see whether it's the students or the the faculty as as skills that employers want. So so there's the skills awareness. There's also, I'd say, the in cultural, uh, the institution, institutional culture problem as well. And um, again, Sandra, you pointed to it, but uh, if, if the issue is, is finding uh, roles for, for this research talent outside of academia in, in industry to an increasing extent, there are a number of times I've encountered principal investigators who not only don't open doors for, for their students in industry, but actively discourage them for getting jobs in industry. So that that is a cultural mindset, I think, especially in the social sciences and humanities that will not do us any favors in the future. But I think just generally in that ecosystem, I think as, as my slide indicates, I would just point to three things I think we need from Shirk's perspective, we need to do uh, well, we're already doing as a, as a research ecosystem, but maybe increasingly uh, uh, increase the amount we're doing this and be partnered research, uh, interdisciplinary research and diversity in the research enterprise. So, so partnered research, um, Sandra has one of these grants and one of our partnership grants. We, we have our individual and team grants, but we also have grants for people undertaking projects specifically with other non-academic institutions. And we recently did an evaluation of that, those programs and uh, students, uh, according to the surveys of those projects, the students on those projects had more marketable skills from the project than our individual grants. And 69% of the students found jobs in that partner, in, in, in that partner institution. So, uh, that I think we need to leverage that more so. Uh, and we need to think across the board, whether it's through a shirt grant or through any, anything else of, of undertaking our research projects more 
in a collaborative fashion to use standard language with other organizations. And that means interdisciplinary research. So all those projects are not tackling whether it's social innovation with they're working with a not-for-profit, if they're working on public policy issues with, with government, if they're working on how to, to, to better green uh, 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 an industry's practices, they're not looking at it through a disciplinary silo. They're taking it a, from, a, from a, a look at it uh, beyond their own uh, disciplinary methodologies and views. So, and then finally, we've still, we're, we're, we're narrowing the gap in a lot of these, but there are still for, for a lot of the equity groups, persistent gaps for both uh, what we see in terms of demand for our, our funding and in terms of what we see of, of the cohort out there. Um, and if for a couple of reasons, I think we need to, to, to narrow those gaps. First of all, if, if, uh, if our innovation ecosystem is gonna rely on a well-educated and diverse um, workforce that that work that well-educated workforce is going to have to be as diverse as the Canadian population or more so. And then secondly, the, the human dimension that SSH education is supposed to provide the employer, if SSH education is supposed to provide that knowledge of how to, to deal with and communicate they, with diverse cultural backgrounds, we're not going to do ourselves a, a, a service if we're, if our, um, if our educated cohorts are not at least representative of the Canadian population. So, so those are my, my three uh, hobby horses uh, around, around the skills agenda would be partnered research, interdisciplinary and diverse research. This is, this is really interesting, especially to learn that um, the students who are involved in our partnerships actually find employment in the not-for-profit or with with the partners and the one thing that we need to not forget is that uh this is actually real progress because there's a lot of attitudes in the in the public and private sector against employing postgraduate ssh students so whenever we're placing a student we're doing something that's good for industry and that breaks down those barriers that already exist thanks so much tim the next speaker is uh, Etienne Rainville, and I know that I pronounce his name in, in French, but but I shouldn't. I should do it in English. Etienne is a senior government relations officer at Universities Canada, one of our partners on this project. Uh, Etienne, your turn. You have the floor. Thank you much, uh, very much, Sandra, and I'll uh, I'll concede. Uh, those with a keen eye might note that I don't put the accent aigu on my e. Um, it's because I'm from Northern Alberta, and that was uh, challenging to grow up with a French name there. Um, so it's something I've dropped along the way and made it a bit of my own. Um, so my name is Aitzin Rainville. I'm a member of the Government Relations Team at Universities Canada. Um, for those unfamiliar with Universities Canada, um, it's sort of the advocacy organization that represents over 90 member universities across Canada. And there's a few functions that are served, but my side is really the advocacy side, um, which is federal government relations. And within that, my focus is the skills file, um, hence my presence on the panel here today. Um, in practice, being at an organization that represents 90, 90 plus universities across Canada on skills, it means I work at the intersection of the federal government, university, civil society, and business, um, sometimes better understood as the labor market or the workforce. And in this role, one of the things that comes up in basically every file I work on um, is the barriers to students finding employment, which is increasingly becoming one of the factors that students are considering and universities and government are looking at when they make public policy decisions around universities. Um, so I'm gonna back out or zoom out a little bit and take a bit of a macro view of the situation. Um, I took an interest in this paper because it discusses these barriers, which I'll be referring to as frictions, um, between educators and employers. So the chart that I have there on the next slide, 
when that comes up, um, is produced by Brendan Bernard, who's an economist at Indeed Canada. Yes, the sort of jobs website um, with data up to November 2020. And it's talking about recovery scenarios um, from COVID. So if anyone had that on their bingo sheet as, as to whether or not someone would bring a COVID lens, um, you can definitely mark that box. Um, so if you look at the scenarios, we now have the benefit of a little bit uh, a later perspective on this. And I think anyone can plausibly rule out the orange scenario, maybe even the gray scenario with how long or how severe wave two is and how long it's taking things to return to normal. I think most economists now are talking about sort of an L-shaped recovery, general vaccination in the latter half of 2021 and sort of slow economic recovery after that. Um, but what is problematic about the, the slow recovery in the long term is what makes the skills conversation all the more acute at the moment. One of the big challenges facing the government, primarily the federal government, but also the provincial governments, um, and in turn students entering the labor force, is the next few in the next few years, the impact of COVID-19 on the labor market. To this government's credit, they recognize this and are promising to make the quote unquote largest investment in Canadian history uh, in training for workers, and they've set out the notional goal of creating 1 million jobs. All of that is the government promising to exercise its primary lever, funding or investment across a number of areas, areas including universities uh, and skills and training, um, which is sort of across the education ecosystem. Um, but it's important to understand the different levers that the different parties have. The federal government, universities, say social science and humanities departments, employers and individuals all have different levers that can be used to impact the skills conversation and therefore the dynamics in the labor market. So there, as other speakers have alluded to, there's natural frictions between academia and employers um, because one hasn't been designed to interconnect into the other directly and vice versa. But there's been a growing demand over the years to reduce this friction and to make the transition from universities to the labor market more seamless. The best example of this recently is the growing interest in work integrated learning or will for short is sort of the buzzword you'll hear in sort of skill circles, um, which includes co-ops, apprenticeships, field placements, practicums, et cetera. Um, will formally and intentionally integrates a student's academic studies with learning in a workplace setting. Now, coming back to the paper specifically, Will is an example where institutions like co-op offices have been established to reduce these frictions. The paper explores a different, more nuanced friction and helps to make it tangible. It explores the perception gap in building and articulating foundational skills between specifically the social sciences and humanities and employers. Um, rightly noting that the perception of skills can be misaligned with actual needs. Um, you know, if anyone has worked at a private company, it, it shouldn't be a shock um, to consider that most HR departments aren't sitting around thinking about how to articulate and define foundational skills. Um, you know, in my experience with HR, often they're copied and pasted from other people's job postings online and sort of plagiarized and reworked in their own way. So having that difference between perception and actual, I think, is a very, uh, a very keen insight. Um, but what the paper really does for me is it uncovers another lever to impact or move the skills conversation, another lever to impact those frictions. A lever primarily to be used by universities as it's sort of put in the paper, but it's also one for individuals to consider how that they can move the lever. Um, once upon a time, a few years back, not so many years ago, I was a political science graduate in Northern Alberta in an industry town, um, looking for work, looking around to local businesses, to see how I could um, gain employment, but also market myself to those businesses with a bachelor's of political science at the time. Um, and it was difficult and I didn't have a lot of resources and I didn't have a lot of sort of conceptual understanding of how to bridge the difference of how to sell myself to organizations that were looking for a technical writer, for instance. How did my skills in political science and writing essays bridge to doing technical writing um, for those organizations? Ultimately, I gave up and I moved to Ottawa, <laughs> um, which has worked very well for me, but it is certainly not an option available for everyone. And so it's great to have more resources available to students, uh, students or recent graduates who are looking to find employment in their communities where perhaps there aren't jobs or career fields in the social science and humanities 
something like a third of students ultimately don't work um, in a field or an area related to their degree. So it's a fairly common experience. Um, so just to tie this all together in sum, um, and happy to discuss any part of it um, in the Q&A. Um, the COVID-19 COVID situation and Canada's economic recovery is adding layers of challenges to joining the workforce, um, which is why the work we're doing between now and when the economy recovers completely in one or two years is all that more important and that much more salient in terms of the skills conversation. Um, there's lots of other factors at play, recon recomposition of the economy, et cetera, um, that I think we're going to have to take into account, but I think that's a topics for another conversation. I, I'll leave it at that. Thanks so much, Etienne. Um, you know, I it's not new that we need, I think the conference board publish at least one report where they emphasize that uh, what students need is to be able to articulate the value of the skill, articulate the skills that they have and communicate them to employers. But I think that, well, at least my hope for, for the report was that it would actually provide conceptual tools to do that in a way that's very flexible and that would allow people to have personal reflections on what they've learned and how to pitch it to employers in the future. But we need more. We need, I think every university needs to step up their game when it comes to equipping their students with these uh, metacognitive toolkits. Uh, thanks so much for your contribution. And you. uh, our next speaker is one of my favorite people, Gail Bucket uh, from MyTax. Gail is Director of Innovation Policy. Well, that's a, that is a high compliment, Sandra, coming from you. So thank you very much. But uh, thank you. Thank you, Sandra, for including me and including uh, my tax on this panel and, and thanks to Ian and Kegs for, for organizing this. Um, so the lens that I'd like to bring to this conversation or the perspective that I'd like to, to bring is really very much looking through the lens of innovation. Um, and Canada really wants to, to prosper and, and, you know, building on uh, Etienne's comments that, you know, and, and if we want to really come back out of this pandemic, you know, strong and and, and vital as an economy, we really need to uh, rely on the innovative potential that our highly qualified personnel bring to the economy. So underutilizing the talent that we're currently producing is a challenge. It is an issue. It's something that Canada uh, really needs to grapple with and to figure out. Um, the fact that we're producing more uh, PhDs now than, than previously is actually you know, that is actually something that's tracked as an innovation metric. And it's one of the only innovation metrics in which Canada actually has been improving in terms of important performance. Lots of other innovation metrics like uh, uh, investments of R&D intensity, um, not only in business or the private sector, but particularly in the private sector, um, the number of patents. Like we're not, we're not at the top of the list for a lot of innovation metrics, but we are producing more PhDs. So it's, it's, it really behooves us to, to, uh, to make the most out of that talent that we're investing in and that those people um, are investing themselves in. Um, and we know the challenges persist. You know, there's lots of things have been articulated already on this panel, but uh, the report that came out from CCA at the end of January, uh, again, emphasized that these challenges still exist. It's still a challenge for uh, people coming through PhD programs um, to move into the labor market, whatever sector they're moving into. So whether it's going into academia, we know there's challenges there, or whether it's moving into the private sector, um, or whether it's moving into the public sector, we know there are challenges. I'm really glad that a, a number of people have pointed out that uh, the skills gap, um, uh, you know, the word perception or perceived skills gap is, it has, has been mentioned by a couple of people that was also in the CCA report. Uh, and I think that's a really, I think that's really an important uh, sort of uh, sticking point for us. So this is, this is something that at MyTax, uh, we think about a lot um, because, you know, this is really a, the, the skills development for, you know, people coming through our higher education systems. That's really at the core of what we do and why we exist. So we, we do invest a lot in thinking about this. We've had a lot of discussions with other, other stakeholders uh, a lot of conversations, roundtable discussions, um, and it, it has become really clear to me um, from, from where we sit um, that there really is a misalignment 
amongst the various stakeholders and, and you know others have alluded to that as well throughout this this session but um, you know employers students educators policymakers and I would include funders in there as well um, are all looking at this from their own perspective they all have their own mandates they all have their own goals and their priorities so it, it, it's not really that much of a surprise that that misalignment exists in the system um, and we, where my tax sits in that in that sort of ecosystem is sort of in the middle, where we're sitting in the nexus of all these different organizers, uh, uh, stakeholders, pardon me, and all of the projects that we support as my tax involve, you know, an employer, uh, a student, or a postdoc, um, and an educational institution, including an academic supervisor. So we're really we're living and breathing that nexus every day. Um, and building those sorts of bridges and collaborations and linkages is not an easy thing to do. <laughs> um, otherwise, it would be happening organically. But it's really challenging because there's that misalignment and, and the vocabulary issue is a big one, as you, you talk about in your paper and as Wendy mentioned in her comments off the top. Um, what each of those stakeholders means is, is also, you know, there, there, there needs to be a bit of a translation role almost um, because uh, everybody's looking at it from their own perspective. So the definitional, definitional issue is an important one, um, but we also have to kind of be ready to, to take, act, take action and, and move beyond that. So, so looking at some of those initiatives that the CPA report labels, I think they call them transitional initiatives. So including things like, like <clears throat> work integrated learning experiences uh, with a host organization or the professional development skills training that are increasingly available across you know the PSE sector also something that that's delivered by my tax uh, those I think are, are the types of initiatives that we really need to build uh, and to strengthen in Canada because I mean from our perspective we do see that they make a difference they do have an impact um, there's some stats on the on the slide there around some of the uh, some of the survey results from our own um, uh, uh, participants in our program so 90% of participating HPPs, and that's mostly PhD and masters and some masters, um, felt that after their internship experience with MyTech, they developed job ready skills. 76% um, that they would like reported that they'd like to pursue a career in industry. And I should say when I say when I'm talking about industry, uh, that for us includes private sector as well as the not for profit sector. It's not just just the big companies. Um, and then we did a little bit of a, um, an exercise to look at where some of our former interns have landed. Um, and you can see there 73% of our master students have leveled in, have, have ended up working in the private sector, 59% of the PhD level have ended up in private sector, and 50% of postdocs have ended up in, in the private sector, which I think is a pretty significant number. Um, but the other side of the coin to, to sort of, um, you know, that, that integration uh, of, of students into sort of that real world scenario where they're bringing those research skills and developing uh, additional skills um, is the impact that it's having on the industry as well. So the students are sort of one side of the coin and the industry is the other side of the coin. Um, and, uh, and while there are still challenges and the private sector may not be you know, running out front to swoop up as many PhD graduates as they can, um, I, I think we are seeing a change. Um, we are, the demand for my tech projects in the private sector and in the NGO sector has increased dramatically over the last three, four years. Um, and we've, we've literally tripled the number of, of internships that we're delivering for that level of HQP across the country. Um, so we're helping companies understand what it is that that a research can do for them in terms of their own sort of challenges, um, but also demonstrating the value that HQP bring to those to those to those sectors. Um, and, and by doing that process, you know, we're, we are building the absorptive capacity across the country um, from our HQP employment. So I think there, I mean, I think that this is a little bit of a bright spot and it's, it's, it's a little bit hopeful, um, but it's not easy and it takes a lot of work. I really uh, appreciated your paper, Sandra, um, because I think it really will help sort of maybe bridge some of that misalignment and help maybe bridge the divide um, as, as uh, if we can get sort of 
different groups in the ecosystem to better understand what it is we're all talking about when we talk about skills and why we want them, right? I, I, you know, the, your point in the paper about employers looking for certain skills because they are very much focused on driving certain behaviors in their companies makes complete sense, but it's not really something that, that uh, I think is, is very often articulated or talked about. So I really appreciated your paper. Um, and my final thought is that, uh, again, from that, from the MyTax point of view, this is something that we're really, really focused on. And, and we're really trying to drive down a little deeper to better understand what exactly are the skills that are needed for innovation. And we're looking even at the different sort of types of innovation, you know, uh, defined by the OECD manual, so product innovation, process innovation, and so on. So, so more work to come from, from my tax on that front, but um, yeah, definitely, definitely a huge uh, issue for Canada and, and ultimately our, our economic performance. And thanks again for in, including the my tax point of view on this panel. Well, thanks, Gail. And I know that MyTax is also deploying increased effort to reach out to social science and humanities because experiential learning and placement in, in that sector has its own uh, challenges. Uh, the capacity of the outlets to actually you know, welcome the students and et cetera. So the way that you're doing is, is uh, extremely interesting and working with uh, Ava at the, uh, the strategic initiatives uh, 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 in the strategic initiatives it has been very interesting in terms of trying to understand what is needed for social science and humanities to to find uh, um, possibilities of employment in, in, in the sector through my tax. So thank you. Our last speaker, but not the least, hmm. is our host, Ian Worley. Thanks so much for making the final comments. Yes, and thank you, Sandra, for having me on this panel and for putting this panel together. Uh, my master plan to be in three places at once uh, has not worked out well, and we're having a bit of a crisis in the next session. So I think I'll truncate my remarks and maybe be um, a bit of a rabble rouser. I'll leave some comments for debate and discussion and then run away. Uh, so hopefully that'll leave more time for, for question and answer uh, towards the end of this session. So as Sandra mentioned, I'm the executive director of CAGS. I don't think I need to introduce CAGS if uh, you're at this conference. Um, but a few things that have really come to my mind since starting in this position, uh, but also reading Sandra's report, um, I've put out here. Now I come at this both uh, as the executive director of CAGS, but also as a history PhD graduate who struggled uh, for some time with the idea of skills and what gaps I had and what I needed to fill. Um, and also a lot of comments from uh, the kind of non-academic crowd about what I was doing with my history degree, why I was taking it. Um, and apologies, Sandra, but the, the common refrain was, well, at least you're not in philosophy, uh, which I totally disagree with, but uh, that seems to be the kind of the hierarchy, if you will. So a few things that I would like to throw out uh, into, the, into the ether for discussion uh, is this idea of at what point do students realize that they are acquiring or have acquired skills? And again, this is a, a kind of a personal reflection. Um, I came to the point at the end of my degree where I decided I was not going into the academic uh, stream, not that I had a choice, uh, and that I needed to go into the Altac uh, community. And that's where I realized that I actually had developed a lot of skills that as a historian in training, I didn't think were relevant or certainly not um, going to advance my career as a historian but kind of in hindsight, I realized we're essential for this job. So one of the questions I've always kind of pondered is, do students realize at the time that they are acquiring these skills or is it a, something that you kind of look back and say, you know what, I actually did acquire that, I just didn't notice. And I think this has a real impact on how we market these skills because if you're kind of acquiring skills in hindsight, you've, you've missed your opportunity. Whereas if you're actively aware that you're, you're acquiring these skills or you need to acquire these skills, um, these foundational skills, I think that can actually change people's perspective before they enter the job market. Uh, my second question is kind of one that I always ask people is who or what is responsible for this perceived skills gap? Um, and maybe in the Q&A section, you, you guys can uh, elaborate a bit on uh, more on that. Um, and my final point here, I think is really interesting. Coming into KEGS, uh, I did the Shirk Storytellers competition, the three-minute thesis competition, and I just assumed that this was something that social science and humanities students would excel at, that storytelling, the narrativization of your research, um, trying to pull on the, the audience's empath, uh, you know, sense of understanding of the project and empathize with their lack of understanding of your research project. And then once I got into KEGS, I realized that very few, if, if even 10%, if that, 
uh, from the social science and humanities were winning these national research communication competitions. And it, it's something that still kind of I'm curious about as to why the students who are supposedly getting all these essential core skills are actually not performing in these in these competitions is that they're not entering that they don't realize they have these skills. Um, and if you go back and look at the previous winners, even the MT 180, the French competition, uh, I'd say it's about 90% or more social science and humanity or um, STEM students. So something to think about, something to ponder. Uh, really apologize for having to run off like this, but uh, my phone is, uh, as, as the, the millennials say, my phone is blowing up. So I'm going to have to go and see what that's all about. But I really appreciate Sandra welcoming onto this panel. And hopefully we can continue these conversations uh, throughout the rest of the week. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Ian. I think that in response to your last point, and we're just going to continue talking mm -hmm. and go on, uh, I think it goes back to what Wendy was saying a little bit earlier about the, the misalignment. And maybe, Wendy, you'd like to say something. Uh, I, I'm just going to ask people who have questions to start writing them in the chat box. I'm going to be monitoring that. Uh, if you have written a question, could you please bring it back? Because there's been a lot of action. On, in, our, in our discussion. Wendy, would you like to make a comment? Yeah, yeah I, I, I do think it is the, the definition of, of communication. And it's, I keep trying to use the analogy of genre, for example. You know, writing a memo requires the ability to use words and construct sentences, but it's a different genre than writing a, an essay. And I would argue that a lot of the competitions are a different genre than many uh, social sciences and humanities students are accustomed to. It's not a lecture. It's not even a presentation. Typically, they're pitch competitions and being able to, um, you know, communicate the elevator speech in, in two to three minutes is often what, what determines who's, who wins. And in professional schools, well, whether we're talking about business schools or engineering schools, there is more intentional focus often on developing some of those skills. So I think it's not even a function of, of curriculum, although in some, um, in some programs in professional skills, you will have a professional communications course, which is very different than what you would get in an English literature course. But very often, there's just a, more of a culture of participating in these things. One of the things we see at Ryerson, for example, is the students, regardless of their discipline, who participate in things like Enactus and some of the, um, some of the, the clubs on campus that have that focus on sort of applying skills to work with business or, or to do entrepreneurship. Um, often develop the kind of competencies employers are looking for. Yeah, um, thanks Wendy. The, the, there's a question here that's addressed to me, but really I think it has to do with what Tim was, uh, was mentioning um, earlier about uh, the, the problems there is with the academic culture overall in terms of um, in directing the interest of students away from something that has to do with, uh, you know, engagement in, in the real, with the real world. Um, Tim, I don't know if you'd like to say something in response to the question, because I'm sure that in English, which is, I think, your, uh, your field uh, as an academic, uh, there are similar problems as well. Uh, yeah, thanks, Andrew. But yeah, like you said, for English and philosophy, I think it's a good question. You know, if the, my supervisor came and said, uh, you know, uh, let's hone up your CV because we're going to go over to, uh, I don't know, wherever, you know, Shopify and see if they've got a job for you. It would be, it's, it would seem out of place. There'd be resistance, right? So, but the students are reflecting the, the department's culture, right? Yeah. The students are not inventing that themselves. Like I, I would have had that perspective because I had been inculcated in, in a certain culture. So I, I, I don't think we can just skirt the issue that way. And I think, um, ways of doing it, I always point to my tax. We've got a great partnership and this is in relation to another question there about whether Shirk's do, doing partnerships with others. We have a great partnership with my tax where, uh, where people who apply to our programs um, are, are fast tracked if they're successful through the my tax process for, for funded internships. So, uh, so definitely this is, this is something, if you bring the students there as, as Gail said, 
they end up getting jobs there and wanting to have careers there. It's not as though uh, we should assume that they don't want that. Yes, do you want to add something to that? Oh, I, we can't hear you, hon. Maybe, you, uh, is this working? One thing that I would add to what Tim is, uh, is saying is that I don't think that we have to, to radically transform the academic career and the perspective of the social science and humanities. I think that there is good uh, in the fact that we're critical and that we're skeptical about corporate court cultures. It's important. Our job is to question assumptions that we're making that make society functional, but that has to be a critical perspective. And it's really hard to do both because it's a question of value. If you value the critical aspect, you're always going to be critical. It's very difficult to, to switch against culture when these cultures are so ingrained. What we need to realize is that, however, what we want is the same thing. We call it in the social science and humanities, uh, the, you know, a student who is capable of uh, global citizenship, of, of um, embracing democracy with critical skills, and in industry, they call it someone who can make, uh, you know, can be a good manager because they have the social and emotional intelligence to, you know, facilitate collaborative work. It's the same thing. Those are the same skills. And it's very transparent when you look at, for instance, um, the, ob the, the objective <clears throat> skills that are, that are meant to be developed by professional development. Um, in especially at the postgraduate uh, um, uh, level, and I know that CAGS has done some excellent work teaming up with the graduate network uh, uh, for postdoctoral and for graduate and postdoctoral students. The skills for professional development and the skills for research, as they are exposed uh, by shirt, are the same. They are the same skills, but they are understood to fulfill different purposes. And I think that's one of the things that the report does. It to articulate the fact that it doesn't make sense to think about skills with the, without thinking about the purposes that these skills are meant to fulfill in a certain context. If that context is academic, it's going to be understood in a different way than if that context is industry. What we need is not a universal way to understand what these skills are and what the purposes are. What we need are toolkits that allow us each time to understand in a context what we mean when we're saying that we need a certain set of skills to fulfill a certain purposes. There's only a limited number of purposes that can be filled. I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. Like they ultimately all go back to innovation, adaptability, collaboration, social and emotional intelligence, and they're universal in all organizations, whether it's in academia and especially in academia, God, we, we need those skills and or in industry. Gail, you wanted to add something, sorry. Yeah, so can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, sorry, I don't know what happened there. I wasn't on mute, my microphone glitched or something. Um, just going back to that, that um, the point about being able to articulate uh, skills there that, that uh, HQP have acquired as, as research trainees and during the PhD program. I think that's really important. And I think it will also help break down some of those maybe perceived barriers, um, you know, like just because you have a history degree doesn't mean you're going to land a job as a historian somewhere. Your job title may, may be very different, right? So, so it's part of being able to articulate that entire package of skills that you can bring to an organization. So, uh, you know, at MITAX, we do this all the time. We aren't discipline specific. We're not sector specific. You know, so we have matched, for example, PhD students from music departments with mining companies to help them with underground acoustics and figure out how to protect workers hearing. You know, um, we have placed historians with software gaming companies who have developed, um, you know, more historically accurate visuals in their um, games, which have become super uh, successful. So. So there, there's, there's, a, there is a perception issue for sure. Might be a little bit of the academic culture uh, issue as well, but, but we really need to, you know, the more I think we can help students articulate the value that they can bring and the skills that they bring, and, and research skills, as Tim was talking about, is hugely important. 
but all the other skills that go along with that, you know, self-motivation, what PhD student is driven to, to, to finish their research, which PhD student hasn't had to solve a multitude of problems along the way. I mean, all of those things are, are kind of already built in to a PhD program. And the more I think students are able to articulate that, the more they'll be able to translate or, or sort of bridge that divide amongst the various sectors, wherever they end up working, whether it's in private sector or pu public or, or academic. I think this is a fantastic last word. Uh, so thanks, Gail, for uh, bringing this panel to a wonderful conclusion. I think emphasizing the importance of postgraduate skills is exactly the way to go. And I think that the key word here is probably interdisciplinarity and co collaboration. If we can do that for the social science and humanities, we'll be doing something that individual super supervisors are not capable of doing and probably shouldn't be doing either because they haven't been trained to do it. So uh, thank you for all for your reflections. I hope this is just the beginning and that we will have a, a lot of other occasions to continue unpacking these questions, but that at least now we can take the next steps, which is to ask, okay, so how do we foster those skills? I think that's, uh, that's my big question as a practitioner. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me uh, about the report or about the collaborative and um, I believe that uh, we will oh. now. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Let me just uh, uh, thank you and all the panel for our, our most fascinating discussion. And, um, and I hope there is follow up throughout the conference. I would also like to invite everyone to, to attend the next session, which is on the two uh, task forces of KEGS, on one on the TRC um, and graduate education and one on excellence in graduate programs. So welcome to that. And thank you so much, everyone, for this uh, this great panel. Thank you. Thanks, Susan.